All right, hello everybody. Today we are going to be talking about analyzing informational text. Now you may already have a pretty good idea of how to do notes, which is sort of like the basic version of this. So we're going to look at some more advanced stuff that is probably going to be a little bit more helpful. We're also going to do it in more of an interesting way than we've done it before. So how this is going to work is that we have a text we're going to go over. And while we go over it, you're going to make different notations depending on the different things that you see because we're going to be using them for different reasons. So this may seem like some extra steps, but one, it's going to be a lot more helpful, and two, not everybody learns in the same way. So if you are somebody that is better at visual learning or using art to help yourselves learn, then this is going to probably help you out in a lot of ways that some of the other note-taking skills that we've done just haven't done. So let's get through this together. Let's start by looking at what it is that you're going to need to do. So in the following thing that we're going to read, as we go through, you're going to annotate with some different shapes. So number one is that you are going to draw an arrow pointing to any words, phrases, or paragraphs that help to identify the time period or the historical context of the passage. In a lot of the things that we read, it doesn't just say... Uh, this took place in 1945. Instead, they'll reference certain historical events. And we need to be able to identify those. Next, you're going to draw a triangle next to any words that you do not know, and then we'll look up the definition for the word. So this should be a skill that hopefully you've started to get at this point. After all, we're living in the future, and the ability to look up words is something that we can do really, really quickly. But having that technology in our hands is only helpful if we actually use it. So let's go ahead and mark the things that we don't know. So that'll kind of give us a list of things that we need to learn as we go through. Then you're going to draw a star next to any significant quotes. And in the margin, you might write why you believe this quote to be significant throughout the passage. Having these down is going to be a big help because as you're, say, writing a research paper, being able to just look and see an exact quote that you might want to include is a great time saver so that you don't have to go back and try to reread the entire passage to try to mine out something that you can use. You can just look for the shape, boom, and you've got it right there. You can just drag and drop. Then you're going to draw a rectangle around the part of the passage that best represents the author's main idea. In the margin next to the rectangle, explain why. So if you remember those things we talked about yesterday, when we go into summaries, having these is a great way to figure out exactly what you need to summarize for your topic sentence or for your main paragraph. And then you don't have to worry about rereading the passage to mine this stuff out. You're going to draw a circle around any use of figurative language. And in the margin, you'll explain how the figurative language impacts the passage. What is not being literally stated, but instead what is used for effect? If you're trying to galvanize an audience in order to pursue some course of action, you can't just lay out the facts. I mean, you can do that, but you also need to include creative language in order to make sure that your audience is engaged. So try to find out when people are doing this. Not only is it going to help you as a writer, but it can also help you when you're listening to people speak to you, be able to identify when are they trying to galvanize my emotions by using figurative language, and is it for a good reason, or are they trying to convince me to do something that I wouldn't otherwise do? Because we're running out of shapes, this next bit will add sticky notes to any part of the passage that you do not understand. So if you're doing this on your computer, you can use the sticky notes app, and if you're doing this on paper, you can just write this on an actual sticky note, or if you don't have a sticky note, you can keep a scratch page of notes, but you just want to make sure that you keep a detailed analysis of what exactly it is that you didn't understand and why you didn't understand it, if you can figure that out, because if you can identify the areas that were weak, then we know how to fix it in the future. And then finally, highlight one quote that stands out the most to you, and in the margin, explain why this quote makes such an impact on you. Famous speeches throughout history are filled with memorable quotes, but usually there's one that really stands out in people's mind, whether it's the I have a dream speech or ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Four score and seven years ago in the Gettysburg Address. So all of those have such a memorable impact that it's difficult to write about the topic without including those quotes. If you can find one of those, make note of it. That's a great way to just start out your paper, to just throw that in there and suddenly you've eaten up a lot of space on your own. So now keep these in mind and if you need to pause the video in order to make sure that you uh, keep this in mind or to open up the um, 
the PDF document so that you have these side by side, go ahead and do that. But we're going to take a look now at the actual text that we're going to be looking through here. And as we go through, you can look through these on your own, but also keep these in mind as you're listening to the speech. So now we're going to look at the Day of Infamy speech by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was in 1941. And it's in response to the attack on Pearl Harbor. So on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, a United States naval base in Hawaii. This attack drew America into World War II. Franklin D. Roosevelt, or FDR, delivered this speech to a joint session of Congress on December 8th, 1941, a day after the attack. So let's go through this speech together. And I'm not going to try to do an FDR accent, so I'll just read this as well as I can. But hopefully the ideas come across to you. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Indeed, one hour after Japanese air squadrons had commenced bombing in the American island of Oahu, the Japanese ambassador to the United States and his colleague delivered to our Secretary of State a formal reply to a recent American message. And while this reply stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations, it contained no threat or hint of war or of armed attack. It will be recorded that the distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the intervening time, the Japanese government has deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to the American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaysia. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. The facts of yesterday and today speak for themselves. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. As commander in chief of the army and navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I believe that I interpret the will of Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us, God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attacks by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Now, we'll give you a second, you can pause the video right here in order to mark these things down as you need them. All right, so at this point, hopefully you've taken that speech and you've gone through and you've marked the things that you need to mark. Now let's take a look at how we might actually use those.
So, using the given text, cite strong textual evidence that supports your analysis of what the author's purpose is. So find parts in the speech that explain why he's making the speech, and you can copy and paste or write those down where you need them, but be able to demonstrate this is why the speech exists. In using the text, make inferences about the deeper underlying meaning of the passage. Why was this so important? What figurative language is used in the text? How does the author's word choice and development relate to the audience? Again, there were parts in there where he didn't just say, Japan attacked us last night, the end. Words were chosen with meaning. What words were chosen in order to rile people, in order to get a response? What are, the, what are two main ideas of the text? Explain and analyze how these main ideas are developed throughout the body of the text. So find out what the main idea was and show, using different quotes or different parts, how those are demonstrated. What is the author's point of view? Explain whether or not you feel as though this was the most effective choice. Explain in your own words the significance of the text. So again, think back to those skills that we learned, how to paraphrase, how to summarize. But you also have to be able to think for yourself. So this is where you have the chance to do that. List two of the common themes that occur throughout the entire passage and use specific examples. And then in your opinion, do you feel as though the speaker was effective in his or her argument? Explain your answers using examples from the text. Do you think that this speech did its intended job? Do you think that it was too soft? Do you think that it was too overblown? Now let's use those other pieces. What time period was this text written during and what historical context exists? So again, this might be pretty obvious. We know this, but can you use the text to back it up? Create a list of five words or phrases that you did not know prior to reading the text. Look up the meaning of each word or phrase and create a sentence using them correctly. Write down the questions that you have about the text. You can create the list of unknown vocabulary. And in your own words, summarize the meaning of the text here. So this is all the things that we've already done. We just want to use these if we need a graphic organizer in order to help us keep our thoughts straight so that we're not just having to hunt for information every single time that we need to answer one of these questions. It's already laid out ahead of time and done for us. And finally, we have our rubric here. How are you going to be graded? We're going to be grading using this rubric. And then we'll also have notes as it comes up. So here is your assignment. You have the tools that you need. If you have questions, as always, feel free to ask. But other than that, let's get to work.